This is Nick Gant with a video on dietary assessment. Joining me today is Luke Gehring from the University of Sydney. Um, we're really lucky to have Luke here. I can't think of anyone better to do this conversation with. Thanks, Nick. Um, Luke did his PhD here at Auckland in dietary assessment, new technologies and dietary assessment. And he's now a lecturer at the University of Sydney. But he's also a dietitian. And he's one of only 6% of registered dietitians that's male. That's right, isn't it? I think that's the statistic. That right? Certainly for the US. So we've got all kinds of uh, novel traits uh, having Luke here. So what we've done is we've put together um, a few slides that Luke's brought with him, and we'll use those to uh, go through some of the topics. So we're going to spend a bit of time on methods of dietary assessment, the pros and cons, and different applications for individuals and for um, research. And then we're going to talk about why athletes are different. And I think athletes, even if you're not interested in exercise nutrition, i.e. it's not your uh, uh, main use, um, they're sort of a good acid test for these techniques because their behaviours are so extreme in terms of how much they eat and, and other things they're doing in their lives. And then we're going to go on to talk about dietary assessment from a nutrition and dietetics perspective in order to reach certain goals and um, and individualise things. And, and Luke's got some novel stuff that he's been doing with his team um, around integrating new technology and things like that. So shall we start, Luke? Why don't you talk us through these methods of dietary assessment, which are for individual assessment and research. They're used for both. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first one we have is a food record, or, or a dietary record is the other name for it. So a food record or dietary record. And essentially that's a prospective method where you record everything um, over th a three to seven day period would be would be the norm four days about average of what people typically do. Uh, so essentially it's, uh, or traditionally, it's been a, book, a booklet where- Yeah, I know you're gonna talk yeah. about apps soon, yeah. but um, Food Record also now applies to doing it digitally yeah. as well. We used to give out a little book, but Yeah, now so it used to be a booklet where you literally you just write down all the details, write down the, you know, the, the product name, you, know, the, you, you estimate you know, what serving size you had mm. and, and what time you consumed it. And we're more, it's more com common now where you just use an app, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So um, ideally, you just need the app, and a weighing scale is good, although you don't have to have that. Yeah, I mean, typically with weighing scales, people don't use them after a few days. So mm -hmm. that, although it's great on paper, yeah, uh, in, in in practical sense, it doesn't work that well. Um, but if you got someone that's really motivated, motivated, mm -hmm. it works great. But over time. Uh, it wanes and then they end up just estimating anyway. Yeah, um, of course so in, in some of the research protocols where people are more committed and yeah, I mean, might if it's be paid, yeah, it's definitely it's short term, it. Yeah, for research purposes, I mean, and it's, they're paid and they're highly motivated and then and obviously it's great. So, so would the gold standard now um, in 2018, would you still have to use paper or are, are most studies using apps? Uh, the Apps are by far, they, they have a lot of benefits over mm. the traditional methods. So, well, let's go into I mean, apps later. I, yeah, one yeah, one yeah, of the so things I do I, in my research sure. is um, allow them to collect the diet with the app, yeah. but then make sure the analysis goes into one of the, the software programs that we talk yeah, about. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so food record's gold standard then still? Yeah, well, it, it's, I'd, I always call it the imperfect gold standard because okay. it's definitely not a gold standard, right? There's yeah. a, time and time again, if you look at, if we do research on, on its validity, it's uh, not that accurate, mm. um, essentially because after a few days, um, people that's the burden of recording everything is just too much. Everyone's got a lot of a lot of activities on, a lot of things to do with work, and even if you've got an app, a really good app, you know you still got to search for your food, you still got to find it in the database, you still got to remember how much you know what portion size was, and then after a couple of days, you know the quality of, of how well you input that information gets reduced. So. Although it can't, well, on paper it's a gold standard, right? If you, if you perform it perfectly, uh, but then it's not a gold standard in, in, when you, in practice you know, yeah. because of that. Uh, um, we, we'll go through some of those things yeah. later, won't we? Um, what, okay, diet history is your next. Yeah, so diet history is typically performed by, I guess, a nutritionist or a dietitian, uh, and this is something that you're going to be doing in a one-on-one in -on -one, um, you know, consultation, right? Mm. You're trying to provide advice to an athlete uh, on their diet, so you need to get a get a diet history. So rather than it being a prospective method with, where the, you know, the individual needs to record it, mm. essentially it's an interview where if I'm assessing your diet, I'll ask a whole range of questions, which is more about your habitual diet. So Nick, you know, what are your typical breakfasts that you have during the week? You know, you might rattle off, you know, maybe two or three top typical breakfasts that you normally have, because mm. people are quite habitual. They have the same breakfast every morning. Or yeah, maybe I'm not very adventurous. <laughs> yeah, so you, or maybe you flip between one or two, you know, mm. and, and then maybe on the weekend you might have something that you change up to. Um, but you can get a kind of a, an average of what someone might have. And you can go through that through the different meals. Um, you know, so you start with breakfast and then you kind of work through snacks and lunch, uh, dinner and, and, and so forth. 
And then after you've kind of got that habitual information, you can then come back and probe, you know, Nick, you told me all these foods, but you didn't mention any, you know, dairy products, you know, mm. and, and oh, yes, no, I, I always have yogurt on this or, or that, or, you know, uh, you know, or you don't mention, because I'm interviewing you, you don't mention any discretionary foods or junk yeah. foods, and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah, well, I do have this, this junk food as well. Um, so, so the biggest weakness is that eyewitness testimony you read yeah, after yeah, so, the fact. Yeah, so you've got to take that normal history first and then you've really got to probe for that other information because, you know, when you've got a one-on-one situation, as much as you like to be honest, you know, you, subconsciously you might, mm. you know, forget a few things and getting those extra details are really important to have a really good diet history. Uh, but the difference between, I guess, a food record and a diet history is that, you know, a, a diet history is far more you know, habitual and, and inclusive of, I guess, your everyday diet mm. um, so it's and it allows the uh, dietitian or nutritionist to then work with you on okay we've got your diet history now how can we modify your diet to achieve the goal you're trying to achieve yeah yeah so probably more popular you clinically than the food record yeah, yeah yeah definitely what have you got next on your list here oh these are the research methods so a bit yeah. too difficult to use yeah. in practice you'd, you'd yeah right. so I mean Wade, Wade Meals is obviously yeah, we talked be about that. your your complete gold standard, right? Because yeah. if you weigh everything and then you hand me the weighed meal and I consume it, obviously that we know exactly what I'm consuming and that's great for lab research where everything needs to be controlled and we're just trying to change one variable. Yep. Uh, obviously not so great uh, when we're out in the real world. No. Uh, food frequency questionnaire, no, that's great for research because it looks at a, a retrospective assessment of your habitual intake, but it's using sort of like a diet history, but it's a questionnaire. So Nick, how often... Do you consume coffee once, you know, once a day, twice per day, you know, once a week, once per month, you know, and, and it's just a tick box. Yeah. And there'll be 140 questions on different foods, and then at the end of that, you know, we get the the frequency of how often you consume yeah. certain foods. So, so you don't have us, to determine a set period of time, go away and do anything because no. they're recalling what they typically so, do. So it's really good for research because it's really cost effective. You can have online questionnaires. You can have you know yeah. you can fill out the questionnaire on your on your smartphone or on your computer um, but it's not good for an individual use case because it's really it's quite uh, crude data because you can imagine you know if I asked you about something seasonal you know how often do you consume oh, strawberries yeah. of course right yeah. uh, so we call them episodically consumed foods because how often do you consume strawberries in you know middle of winter not very much yeah you know, but over the over the summer yeah with the supply more. chain in New Zealand yeah. everything is seasonal yeah. Sorry, I see how that could yeah, become so, a big factor um, so, and, and even but even common things you know how often do you consume fish you know, is it once per week or twice a week? And so every food you've got to think about you know, cognitively, uh, you've got to make that decision in your head. Mm. So it's, it's, it's quite crude, but it gives us good sort of habitual intake of a population or a group. Yeah. No, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, and your final one there is 24-hour dietary, dietary recall. recall. Yeah, so this is probably the most popular method now for research because it's quick, it's a, large, it's a systematic process, it's mm. being validated, and it's used actually for all dietary surveys in New Zealand, Australia, the UK are just moving to it now. They used to use a food record and they're moving to a diet and 24 hour recall and also in the United States. Um, so essentially this is another retrospective method, uh, but it's only of the previous 24 hours rather than say a month, like the okay. food frequency questionnaire. Because typically you can remember m- most of what you consumed yesterday, uh, right? Yeah. So, but, and, the, and the way the method works is it's got multiple passes and it starts at the start of the day and works right through the day where you record or you recall, what do you mean by multiple recall. pass? Explain. So, yes, yeah, so I'll explain. So essentially, the first pass, you know, uh, yeah, uh, the first pass will be, you know, starting at the, the start of the day. What was the first thing that you consumed yesterday? Yeah? Mm. You know, and you will just write that down. We won't worry about the details. You might just say, "I had toast." Yeah. Right. And the next thing I had was, um, I, I don't know, you had a muffin when you got to work in a coffee. Right? right. And then you, and then so we just go through that. We just list them all down. We don't need to worry about any details. Uh, and then we come back. And then we say, okay, you know, yeah. how much toast did you have? What, uh, you know, and we get all those details there. And then once we've got through your, your toast details, we move on to the next meal. So it's quite okay. systematic. Then when we get to the end of that day, oh, sorry, the end of that pass, we then go back and then I might probe for additional details. Again, sort of like the um, diet history where, you know, I've noticed that there's no dairy or there's no other certain food. Remind them of things. Yeah, so we So you add a layer of complexity. Yeah, there's a layer of complexity time. each time. And the third pass as well where you might do times things like time as well and location. Mm. So we know the details of your food now. What time do you think you consume that and where did you consume that? Mm. So essentially we're focusing on segments of information that builds 
and it's a, it's a standardized process now that's it's been validated and published and everyone adopts the same method around the world so what do these uh, abbreviations mean that we yeah so here? the oh we've got a spelling mistake on that slide that should be the intake 24 uh, okay. so that's uh, <laughs> our <laughs> i take 24 yeah the i take 20 maybe it's a new method uh, so the intake 24 is developed in the united kingdom by U newcastle university uh, and so that's a self-administered online method so rather than me doing an interview and asking you what you consumed yesterday they've built some nice uh, websites now where it's an online self-administered self-administered process where you can just go through and do that 24-hour recall yourself okay and it's becoming popular with research because one it's i don't we don't need to pay me to interview you yeah and you don't need to come in or have to take a phone call from me to interview you you can do it online so we can actually do multiple 24-hour recalls in a row so rather than right. just doing one we yeah. might do one on Monday, we might do another one on Wednesday and another one on Friday and one on Sunday or something. Uh, so it's, it's, I guess it's more cost effective. Yeah. Uh, the other one is the ASA 24, which was developed from the Cancer Institute in the United States. And that's now been adapted for the Australian population and the, I think, the United, United Kingdom as well, perhaps. Uh, but essentially, they've, they've developed an American one that's, I guess, a, a platform they can then sell as a service to yeah. other, other nations to develop their own, okay. know, put it their own back end in. Uh, the Intake 24 has actually been recently uh, developed and updated f and is under trial, I believe, at Auckland University for a research group too. Okay, great. I'll probably come across that one. Yeah. Hey, let's have a look at these apps because that's the exciting thing for me. Um, Talk us through these different apps. What are just just the basics? What are they? Which ones are these icons? Yeah, so top to bottom. Uh, so at the top we have, I believe it's Calorie King. Um, we, then we have uh, My Fitness Power, which is uh, the most popular, uh, I guess, fitness app with uh, you know millions of downloads. Easy Diet Diary, which is um, run by Zyrus, that own FoodWorks. Uh, then we have My Net Diary, which is another American-based company, uh, and then uh, My Fat Secret by Calorie King or Calorie Counter, I, I believe. Um, so these are all just commercial operations, commercial companies that are selling service essentially. Uh, yeah. And some are doing it as, as a, like an online platform where you, um, you know, where they can uh, sell their platform to, to uh, professionals such as nutritionists or dietitians. Others are for consumers such as My Fitness Power, where anyone can sort of download the app and uh, then use that app, and it's you know got that community social media kind of network where you can um, you know have goals and friends and try to meet those goals. Yeah. I'm interested in hearing about the analysis because it's, it's capturing the data is relatively straightforward and you've got some techniques to show us that are improving that all the time. But for us, particularly in New Zealand, it's it's all about the database that it interrogates to, to produce your answers yeah, and sure. the nutrients. Um, we've got here some of the advantages and disadvantages of the apps that you've put yeah. together. So the, so the biggest advantage of apps is the reduced burden. So recording your diet using a traditional pen and paper uh, is just a massive burden and it just becomes too tough. Mm. Um, so, you know, time and time again, every single paper that's looked at this or research paper has shown that participants prefer electronic apps. You know, apps, mm. everyone's got a smartphone, they prefer apps, it's easy, they can do it in their own time. So, so there's a huge reduced burden. Uh, and obviously with that, you've got a simple user interface. Yeah. Um, before we had smartphones, we had sort of PDAs and other things <laughs> where the usability was just terrible. Yeah, the paper would have been quicker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the paper was quicker. And even now, you know, some of the more poorly, I guess, designed apps, you know, they might, the, the, then the search functionality actually might actually take a bit more time and actually create a burden. But if it's a well-designed app with a good search functionality mm -hmm. and a good database, obviously that makes it uh, a lot easier to find your foods. Also, a lot of apps now have barcode scanners where you can scan the barcode yeah. of, of well, you know, processed products. Mm -hmm. And you're going to show us some Im image recognition stuff in a, yeah. in a moment as well. Yeah, sure. Um, in my classes, I found maybe five years ago, a few people were preferring the app, the yeah. techie, techie students. Yeah. Um, over the last couple of years, it's rare to find somebody who ha has a paper-based copy yeah, anymore. Yeah, exactly um, the same. Mainly because they're free, but because people are becoming more tech-savvy. In fact, I, I, I'm probably the last couple of hundred students I haven't seen one uh, submit a paper-based record. So this is really, we, we should move on from paper because this yeah, is really where the future, yeah, yeah, the future it really is, is. Uh, which is pretty good for your career, right? <laughs> I guess <laughs> Okay, so. um, where did we get to? So we're, we kind of got to the usability. So the other uh, aspect which I mentioned briefly is obviously it's easier to input your information, but there's also the feedback, right? So you get the feedback from apps. So if you put in your height and your weight and your activity level, it's going to give an estimate of your energy expenditure or mm -hmm. and what sort of your energy goal should be for the day. So you, it has 
basically you know real time nutrient analysis and we'll give you an impact of a feedback on where you sit for that day and if you're over or under your goal for the day so that's a huge uh, bonus uh, which uh, which is a little bit difficult for research because sometimes we don't want to provide that feedback um, but uh, for you know for consumers that's great um, uh, the other aspect is uh, yeah, real-time monitoring. So I mentioned before, a couple of the companies have an online platform. Mm-hmm. So it's great for a nutritionist. You don't need to wait to so go you, in you, and you, submit. You can, rather than seeing your um, patient or only knowing about what your patient or client's doing, you know, when they come in to see you, you can, you know, you could build into your subscription model or in terms of how you how you see your clients, you can monitor their diet, right? Because yeah. if, you, if you, they're part of your, your network, you can see how they're going and, you know, you might put them a text or a message or something to say, you know, great work. I see that you've been, you know, doing really well over the last seven days. So that was, you know, couldn't do that a few years no, ago, no. and now it's just commonplace. Um, yeah. So it's a huge advantage. It is, yeah, um, huge. Uh, the next one is obviously linked to uh, major nutrition data. Yeah, this is what we need yeah. to talk about yeah, here. Sure. It's a real problem we have in New Zealand. So for me, it uh, doesn't matter what data you've collected, the nutrients um, that are stored within the records at interrogates are the most important part of the analysis. Yeah. Um, talk us through those major databases. I often need a bit of a recap on this. Uh, so in New Zealand, we've got food files, which is um, basically our, our uh, I'm not sure who actually looks after the database at, at this stage. I hope someone um, does. <laughs> no, they don't. It's, I forgot the organisation's name now that I live in Australia. Um, but essentially, food files is our, our standard database, which is, you know, it contains a few thousand foods, and it's the same database that's used for our national surveys, and it's used by Zyrus in the back of their food works that's program. Food, that's what we um, use in the yeah, lab. So yeah, and, and, and in the and. There's other smaller databases that look at specific nutrients, um, but Food Files is our major, I guess, database. However, um, the uh, the apps, the commercial apps we have in New Zealand, um, in terms of, because I'm obviously interested in research and, mm-hmm. and grabbing that data, you know, we don't know what, what databases they use. Um, right. Because a lot of their um, stuff is crowdsourced, where you can find a product and you can take a photo of the barcode, uh, and, you know, they might upload some information yeah. on, on its nutrient profile. And a commercial product um, packaged the same here and say in the US can be completely different in terms of yeah, uh, what's in it and, and what's allowed in the local regulations and yeah, everything definitely. else. So uh, and there's labelling issues too. Yeah. Um, so this is a big problem I get now because um, I'll have a student um, or, or the participant will um, say, I've done my food works analysis, it's incorrect because this app I'm using is free app, Doesn't it's showing it. something completely different. It's typically in the macronutrients and it, it can also be in the energy density. And if you're talking about things like soft drinks, there can be caffeine in, in there that's not um, not included in New Zealand. Yeah, so yeah. there's all kinds of drugs, products, uh, but micronutrients is a, is a big one, particularly for fortification of food, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, sure. And um, a lot of, and if some of these commercial apps because they might just have the micro, micro macronutrient information, but the mm-hmm. micronutrient information might just be sort of estimated. They might yeah. not actually have that. Um, so um, accuracy is not always the best. Yeah, I don't. Um, uh, we we have got we have got accuracy on there. So we've got some the main negative points yeah, of, of yeah, using an app. Yeah. Um, so obviously, without proper training, I mean, with research, we always train participants how to use the app and how to search for the correct sort of food. Because what one of the biggest things we find is that people get a bit lazy. Mm. Uh, and they, they might have, and that's the problem with apps, is sometimes there's too much information. So mm. you might have 30 different types of milk to choose from. And you know, the difference in milk doesn't matter so much, but other foods do. Yeah. Um, and they'll select, they'll basically a wrong food, they'll do an input error, where they just select the wrong food, mm. and which might have a completely different macronutrient distribution. Mm. Uh, and, then they might also, and then they also have errors in their portion size as well. Um, so it's better that they put something in, but obviously if it's the wrong food, it's... It's yeah, wrong food. yeah. Um, uh, we've got we've got some ways of improving that in a moment. So, um, you're going to talk a bit about validity, weren't you? And then we yeah. Got... Well, essentially, I mean, a lot of these apps haven't been validated. The, mm-hmm. um, a couple have more most recently, um, but they haven't been validated in sort of large scale studies using um, gold standard methods. So, um, old traditional methods of dietary assessment, we didn't have an app. You would run a large study and you'd compare your app versus say weighed meals, or you compare mm-hmm. it versus doubly labelled water, and you would get a good gold validation study of you know where your where your method lies and it, with its validity. Um, where a lot of these commercial apps they don't, right? No. Um, there's no validity testing at all. Um, so in terms of you know if we're recommending something or using something, if we don't know how accurate it is, so then it's hard to yeah. judge its quality in terms of making ju- making calls. And we've got a big slide here now from a paper in um, a JMIR. Uh, talk us through this. This is—I yeah. I think this is so a this nice is, way to look at it. Yeah, this is a researcher, or 
uh, uh, Juliana Chen. Uh, so she sim- did a quite a simple study, but an important one where she um, used weighed meal or used a weighed meal for a day or a day's weighed meals. And then downloaded, I think it looks like 25 or so different apps, the most popular dietary assessment apps you can get on the, on, on the iStore or the Google Play. Uh, and then she input, you know, quite methodically, make sure she did it uh, you know, really well, the, the dietary intake for the day from those apps. So what we can see from the chart is zero would be, you know, perfect agreement. Yeah. And this is in um, energy difference between the gold standard in terms of um, uh, total energy in, 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 the, in the, was it a day or? I believe it was a day. Yeah, versus what the app reports, yeah. right? So the left, the, le- the bars spanning to the left are under-reporting Reporting. and the rights are over-reporting. Yeah. Are they in calorie, are they in they're kilojoules? They're in kilojoules. Yeah. So it, it doesn't look that bad when you say only minus 700 kilojoules yeah. <laughs> um, versus and That's plus. gonna be magnified Day by day, yeah, over a week, so. and and remember that this is a highly motivated um, researcher making sure she's really careful mm. in terms of what she's doing. This is the um, best case scenario. Yeah, best case scenario. Yeah. So it's going to be worse than that for sure. Um, but we've got anywhere from minus seven hundred to plus one thousand kilojoules. So we've yeah. got a you know two thousand kilojoule swing in a day between different apps, which is you know quite a large swing, yeah. especially if we go day over day. And as we said, as we said this yeah. was the best case. And we're not here to name and shame these products no. here because they're constantly updating and changing. Yeah, yeah. We, this we might be different it, the next can't time. Really we, say, we can't look at the lowest one there and say this is the best app because no. this was a specific meal and a specific. This was done in Australia. Um, and it was specific foods on this one day. Yeah. So if this student were, had a different type of diet, had different type of foods, then different apps might have come out you know, yeah. better off or, or, or stuff. But it just shows the variation you get with different apps um, and how, yeah, how, how you know, we need to be careful about when we're yeah. making decisions that this is, it's not always the most accurate data. Sometimes it could be quite crude if we're not making sure our, our individuals or whoever who are getting to record are doing it well. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the stuff now you're doing in the technology space at the University of Sydney, and this is your, um, this is your sales pitch. Look, you've got the badge <laughs> up there and everything. Uh, talk us through this, Luke. Yeah, so eDia was the first, um, I guess, the first version of the smartphone app that they created at the University of Sydney um, from the Nutrition and Dietetics Group. Um, we've developed the second version of it now, which is... Um, undergoing sort of validation and, and testing, but essentially there's no research grade um, app that's open to researchers in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so obviously being the University of Sydney, this is starting off with Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's available on both platforms, iOS and Android. And obviously it's got the standard sort of stuff like automated nutrient analysis, but it's got other benefits too, you know, the ability to turn off feedback to the users. So if we're doing a research study, we don't want the, the participants to know how much energy they're consuming, you know, we can turn that off. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can, obviously, then we can get the, all the data and we can manage our own nutrition database and we can build on that. So when we get, we, we can look at the search terms that um, people use and then we can improve our search functionality. We can, we've got students that have gone out and uh, collected information on about 16,000 foods in, from Australian supermarkets. So mm. we can build up our nutrition database. But then we can also clean the database, make sure there's no mistakes in it. Yeah. And then, you know, then we can validate it and then use it for studies and then keep iterating it, I guess. Oh, that's great. So w- when you talk about the term validity, you mean there's no systematic bias between the food record offline approach yeah. and, and this, this whole system, including yeah. the back end that you're going to talk about now. Yeah. Let's have a look at some. I, I just want to see the screenshot. Yeah, so <laughs> this is, the, I'm not a fan of pink myself, but uh, this is, the, the, I guess, the new layout here. So on the left hand image we have you know breakfast so you'd, you'd select breakfast and then we have a search box in the middle in that middle image there um, so you might, might search apple uh, and then um, you know from that you'll have different suggestions that will come up and um, you'll have a, a list of foods but you also might have some quick keys there which are in those little pink bubbles um, yeah. different things uh, and then on the right hand side that's just some sort of the list of foods that you can shoot for that day and then you just press plus and and add another one. That's great because then you've got the frequency quick foods, just drop them in. Yeah, and yeah. If you're um, a creature of habit, yeah, then you don't have to do a great deal. Yeah, for sure. And the way this works as well is because we've designed it for research initially, is at the end of each day, all that information gets sent straight to our servers and then it's actually removed from the participants. So they can't go back. Yeah. So they can't go back and change their behavior based on what they've been eating the last few yeah. days. Because yeah. that's, that's a problem with food records, is where you, you're recording what you eat and then after a couple of days, you think, oh, have the same breakfast every day. Maybe I should change. Yeah, that. yeah. So yeah, maybe change. two of the things we didn't discuss that I always find is um, it's not particularly accurate because you tend to be on your best behaviour, yeah. or they just lie. And yeah. People lie, yeah. particularly. So, and sports is a good um, 
example of that because somebody may be under some kind of pressure to follow a good diet and may even get fined if they're not uh, on the same page as their yeah. um, support staff. So, so we'll talk a bit about that later though, I guess. Hey, um, let's look at the nuts and bolts. I know you've got them up here on this diagram. Yeah, so this is a, a app that's been developed in the United States out of Purdue University. Um, and uh, they've been developing this for years actually. And it's sort of, it's, it shows, I guess, the movement away from your traditional app where you may search for the food and, and you're you know, using text uh, and then um, find the food and select that food. Uh, instead, this is an image-based approach, or you know, Im so image-assisted dietary assessment, which is really the big movement now in apps. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we make it even easier for participants? Where if the food's available to take a photo, they can take a photo. If they've forgotten, well, then they can just write it in the old way. Um, yep. So essentially, what this shows is uh, we have a client or or um, or an individual that takes an image of their food, and it has to be, unfortunately it still has to be on a plate at this stage, or, oh, okay. or, or, or at least nicely presented in some yeah. way. All so right. it's showing the limitations, right? Uh, and then we, what we've all got, also got on the screen there is we see a checked marker next to the plate. Oh, okay. Um, so this, this uh, system... Just a reference. That's a reference all. marker. Yeah. And it's that, a newer version of it uses a coloured marker, so it provides some, I guess, some reference points for colour and mm. some reference points for size and scale. And what that allows it to do is then send the information to the server. It can then automate, um, it can identify the food using a nutrition um, database, mm -hmm. like the UUS one. And can also then estimate the volume of the food. And they've shown that to be pretty accurate. Um, so it estimates the volume of the food and we're using food, uh, you know, food densities and they can work out the portion size or estimate the portion size of that food. Uh, and then what n number four there, it then sends it back to the user. So the user will see the foods have been labelled with what the you know the the uh, analysis believes the foods are. The user can then confirm yes that definitely is toast and that is scrambled eggs, mm -hmm. uh, and they can then adjust or confirm the estimated oh, good. portion size. That's great. Okay, so so that's so a, error. yeah. So yeah. so it's trying to it's it's basically trying to make the system simpler for the participant, yeah. um, but then. We know that image analysis is not perfect at this no. point, right? Um, well, this is getting a bit technical yeah, for me. Yeah. So I told you, I said I don't want. I'm not going to buy this until I see it. Yeah, so, sir, uh, sure. what we've uh, <laughs> what we've got here is an example of the kind of thing it can do. Yeah. Um, on the screen here. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is a good example of where where um, we seem to see some, I guess, normal normal users like ourselves be able to use some of this um, machine learning and AI technology, mm. you know, in the real world. Um, so this is simply a couple of images here that shows that I've. Taking it, this is an app, uh, My Fat Secret, um, where you, anyone can download it. It's a free app to use. Um, and you can take a photo of foods individually, such as well, I took a photo of that banana yesterday. Uh, and then within a few seconds, it will uh, do an image search and it will identify it's a banana. And you know, then you, can, then you okay. can select banana. Well, let's see if it works. So I've got uh, an apple here. So I'm going to put it on my white desk. Sure. And then we're going to see if, uh, if, if Luke's talking rubbish or not. Um, Oh, just took a photo. Oh, he's got a photo of his foot. We won't do that. Did it? Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. So he's clicked the button. Yeah, apples. Oh, apples. Okay, okay, this is a gala apple. What have we got on the screen? We can choose apple. Yeah, so we select apple, apple and then it will give us the, the different types. We can there select it is. Gala. One medium gala. Gala, gala apple, seven centimeters diameter, RDA, 3% of something. That's great. So um, I can I don't reckon that's quite seven, but um, you can adjust it. Then. You can adjust um, it. Yeah. So brilliant. they give you the most oh. common, you know, average serve size, and yeah. then you can go from there. Yeah, that's really so it easy. really makes it a lot easier than searching Apple, then finding, then searching Gala. You know, it's, yeah. they're trying to take a couple of clicks away, makes it easy for you and me and everyone else. Yeah. Oh no, so that's that's it's great. Not perfect yet though. Uh, on the right, I've got a, it's an example where we've got a two different foods. Mm -hmm. You know, it's identified the tomatoes. Um, as a second option, uh, but it hasn't identified the banana. It's missed the banana, and the sugar's going to be different in that green one <laughs> <Sure laughs> to the right one. Uh, but I, I just did that as an example. Is it's we're getting there. It's really yeah. great to see this innovation coming to us. We can use it. You know, this mm. was just all hypothetical a few years ago, and now anyone can use it for free. Yeah. So hopefully, in a few more years, we can get a few more, a bit more complex with our image analysis. Yeah. No, that's great, Luke. Right. Um, Let's talk about a different topic now, athletes, that test case, but um, sure. quite relevant to some of the other, other stuff we do. Um, and as we said here, um, accurate assessment in athletes is really hard, and there's a number of good reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are these studies you've popped up here? Yes, yeah, sure. So I've just got the general population at the top and then athletes below. Um, so there's hundreds of different studies, and it's, it's widely known, you don't even need to cite it anymore, that underreporting is a problem mm. with dietary assessment. So essentially, People forget to report what they've consumed, or on purpose they underreport. You know, they they avoid they omit foods from their recall mm. or from their food record, and therefore 
their energy intake is less than what it should be, which we call underreporting. And it's almost every time if you have an increased body weight or BMI, that's significantly associated with increased underreporting. Yeah. Right. So we can look at New Zealand dietary data. We can look at um, sorry, dietary survey data, survey data. We can look at you know any study where, where someone's got to say overweight or obese. Mm-hmm. You know they'll have significantly more underreporters or low or what we call now low energy reporters in um in that in that group than if you're of of lean body weight. Mm. But we've actually but we've actually seen an increase in the last decade of people who are lean underreporting significantly more. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the clients to... for a dietitian tend to have high BMI. Yes, they do. They're there so, to solve so a weight management about, If we're trying to solve weight management issues and mm. we know that they're underreporting, um, you know, it's 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 quite easy to tell with a bit of experience that they're underreporting because you know that the calories or the energy doesn't add up to what their their body weight would be in terms of being able to sustain that. Mm. I mean, if it's significantly below what they could sustain, then there's definitely some underreporting. Yeah, yeah. There. You can't cheat the physics. They no. should be losing <laughs> exactly. weight if they're eating yeah. that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so what about athletes? So athletes underreport, but they underreport for a different reason. Um, and essentially, um, they've got huge. Generally, you've got far greater increased energy expenditure, right? Yep. So you're training hard, and these I'm talking about elite athletes or mm-hmm. you know, serious athletes. Uh, and what, so we're talking here, it could be six to seven thousand calories a day. So twice yeah. twice as but, many calories. But as, even as the, even even people who are maybe just uh, you know three thousand to four thousand, mm-hmm. you know, like double rather than mm. triple or you know mm. um, basically what we've seen with some studies is that you know, the more you exercise or the greater your energy expenditure is with your training uh, because you've got say two trainings a day maybe they're two high intensity trainings you're going to have a significantly greater opportunity or you will under report significantly more mm. and that's you know highly cor- correlated because um yeah, there's just less chance. There's less chance for you to remember things. You're there's just there, more to hungry. do. Yeah, there's more, more to food, do. more to do. You're when training for two hours. You're eating during that two hours yep. say, in the morning before. You're, you're knackered just, after training. You're knackered. You can't remember what you had, and you know you forget those details. And then you go training in the afternoon. So that you just got more opportunities. You're consuming mm-hmm. more food. Um, so they don't mean to underreport. It's unintentional. But mm-hmm. when we're trying to you know act, measure accurately, if we're worried about say carbohydrate intake or something like that. Yeah and we're missing a whole bunch, uh, then you know we need to kind of account for that and make sure that... Yeah, and what you're missing can be the difference between changing the current... Diet yeah, and, and not... The... Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we've got these things down as the why here. We, yeah, we're a bit so behind we're on this summar- one. Summarize yeah, so increase EP eating episodes, more chance for error, and greater chance every time of, of yeah. this report. Yeah, and that's, like we said, consumption during training and snacks in between, and then just also the burden. You know, it's, it's not really... Um, it's not... They're professional athletes. The last thing they want to be doing is spending a lot of time recording their diet. Yeah, They've well, got they, other things to worry. They might be on the go. So if you're riding a bike and you're drinking stuff out of a bottle or that's in your back pocket, <laughs> yeah. it's quite hard to record how many milliliters of fluid yeah, you're you not going to be ingested and spat out when you're on your bike. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we, um, we get that. And within Thai squads, yes, yeah. definitely that accountability issue. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, what we with sports teams, it's very difficult because you may only have one dietitian as well. That should be managing a squad of thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so. You know, there's less accountability of do I actually need to do this, and then there's less motivation and yeah, so forth. Well, so we've got some we've got some data here. Um, this is a table we produced from British Journal of Nutrition, um, and I think we've changed. We've also added uh, calories to the energy expenditures there that are in jewel, megajoules on the yes. on the table. Talk us through this. Then this is a number of different types yeah, of sports, isn't it? It's a bit busy this slide, but essentially, if we look at the the top line, we've got six um, six male offshore racing sailors. Right, so we could think of the Volvo Ocean Race that's just been completed. Right, you know, quite intense uh, exercise um, during that race, intense sport, which might go for a substantial, might go for months. You know, or mm. you, you're th- you could be three weeks or two weeks between yeah, the, the ki- between ports. The kitchen's not flash in no, the yacht either. It's not great. <laughs> uh, and so what this is looking at is this chart showing um, we've got here we've got the. Um, energy intake method. This wasn't a dietary assessment method. They used a food inventory, so I guess they knew okay. exactly what was on the boat. Yeah, and then yeah. They, they measure, and then they knew what was um, what was consumed afterwards. But what we see is we see eleven percent uh, difference between their energy intake and then their energy expenditure, which, which we measured using W level water, which is obviously a very accurate method. Mm. Um, and we can see uh, calories is four thousand six hundred, so about more than double, you know, your, your standard, your typical population. Um, but you know, over time. 
11 percent decrease you see significant body weight loss over that time. yeah yeah and well, then and then if you have that significant body weight loss over time you're going to make some poor decisions later in yeah. the race uh, and the more acute um, types of exercise the differences are, are, are bigger there and yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the endurance ones here yeah. uh, right if you flip to the bottom there yeah of course I mean, we always think about Tour de France because yeah. they're it's, at, it's, it's some of the stages when they get through all the prolonged things and they're actually in the mountains all day long um, huge energy expenditures that we've got a 7,000 calorie there yeah, yeah. No, not many opportunities to eat as soon as you finish no. racing you're eating till and, you're sleeping but really. if you watch the Tour de France as well they get food bags yeah know, over the hours and, and they'll get a food bag and they'll be full of jowls they'll be full of different snacks and things mm. But they don't eat full food bag; they throw it away. So we can. Ah, and you can't pull it out the bush to <laughs> then go and weigh everything no, that sure was in it. A fan's probably taken. Yeah, they've stolen it. And, souvenir. And, yeah. um, so we we see they're huge. We started off, you know, relatively not not accurate, but minus thirteen percent in week one, and as we get down to. Week three, we had minus thirty five percent difference between what they've recorded and what. Yeah, um, that's that's a ridiculously high error. That's yeah, beyond. That's not. A, that's a non trivial error if you're doing a research study. At that point, the, the information's useless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what it shows you is that it, over the over the period of the race, they just can't be bothered doing it anymore, and they're just writing down a few things. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how what Tour de France rider would would do that these days. No, <laughs> I'd have no. to get paid a bonus to do that on top of the exactly. Work. But the cross country um, skiers seem pretty onto it, don't they? Um, yeah, so, to, so for whatever reason, they they um, they probably got a really good group that yeah, were training um, hard and well supported. Yeah, but um, I like that. I like that paper. It's um, old now, but I guess the habits will be the same. Be yeah, interesting it's old, to but it shows a lot of different sports, and it's a similar yeah. trend across all the sports, except for that um, you know cross country skiers, which was I guess a relatively small study. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's great, Luke. So, um, what we've got here is an overview of those sources of error, right? Yeah. Um, with the misreporting or the underreporting at the top there. We've been through some of these. Any of you, any there you can see that we haven't talked about yet? Um, You've done so the BMI. So supplement, our supplement usage. Our supplement usage is yeah. always an issue. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, people, there's a lot of supplements now, especially if you're consuming. You know, if you're talking about building muscle mass and you're mm. and you're consuming whey protein or something like that. You know, that's a lot of energy that you're also consuming. There could be carbohydrates with your supplement. You know, that was so a mass gain or something, and often people forget that that's part of their dietary intake. Yep, right. I mean, so that you don't you forget to tell me about it, I forget to ask you about it, or you forget to put it in your app because yep. you, it's not food; it's just your supplement. No. But if you're having two shakes a day and you're having thirty grams of protein per shake and some carbohydrates in that shake, you know that's a huge amount of energy. It can be a huge, huge contribution, and yeah. and sometimes, particularly with athletes, if it was given to them by somebody else associated with the team, I assume it uh, groups know. more with a medicine than a food. Yeah, um, and yeah, even sure. even the ones professional that, sports teams, the rugby teams. New Zealand, they they get their supplements um, organised and handed to them at the end of training. So you know they, they might not even know exactly how much they're having of, of that particular yeah. supplement. So you take for example a supplement that isn't the macronutrient supplement that you might not think about. Yep. So for example, creatine. Yeah, for a lot sure. of creatine has glucose in now to yep. aid with the uptake yep. and a few other things. So you may be getting a huge amount of sugar when you're having your twenty grams yeah, a day sure. or something. Um, even things like. Um, uh, analgesics can have some caffeine in there and if you're um, on some yep. kind of caffeine restriction or yeah, performance yeah, caffeine plan yeah. so um, you really need everything there without yeah. getting too personal about what are the medications that the, the, the person's person taking that. yeah uh, and then some ra- so they're, they're, they're all areas that will cause under reporting all the top ones essentially but then we've got some random errors which could be positive or negative um, for some of these so it's just portion size estimation you know where you might go you might underestimate but then on, on others you might overestimate so it's not, it's a sort of a random error. It's, it's not so important, um, but obviously we'd like to be as accurate as possible. Mm. Um, lack of food knowledge, I think we've talked through that. You're sleeping the wrong foods. Yep. Um, don't know the ingredients, obviously. You know, yeah. Elite athletes, often the food is going to be prepared for them if they're in, if they're in a training camp. Yep, they may be in a cafeteria or canteen. Yeah, yeah, um, so they just actually don't know what, how it was made or how it was prepared. Yep. Um, so that's another issue. And we've been through this app uh, yeah. database issue yeah, already. Have. So now that's a good overview. Um, should we just talk about then? So, that, you know, it's, that, that, obviously it's hit and miss sometimes. Yeah. Um, we've got some new approaches, though, that you've been involved with and are happening at the moment. Tell us yeah. about these apps and so sports I've teams. I've been specifically involved with these, but I've, I've, I've used, um, I've obviously talked to different dietitians uh, mm. that use different approaches. And essentially on the, on the left there, we've got Snapchat. Um, and the, that's the, the other icon. one is uh, Meal Logger. Uh, so what, what, from my discussions I've had with different dietitians and different sports teams uh, across New Zealand is that you know the, the information that they get sometimes is so terrible um, because they're so busy say because the, the most important time usually is say the pre-season where they're trying mm-hmm. to say um, gain weight before the rugby before the super 15 before the champ, super yeah we should super, say these, change, change name every these are two rugby teams yeah, for, yeah. for people who these are um, two rugby teams yeah. um, so you know it might be pre-season a really important time 
Um, but say the management has got all the dietitians just been fed up with the quality of the information because mm. they're so busy with training and they've got a whole squad of athletes um, that they can't monitor at all. It's too much for them to comprehend and take in because mm -hmm. even if they did it well, the, the dietitian then or the nutritionist has to comprehend and analyse all that information and decide if it, it's good. Mm. Um, so sometimes it's not always about a formal approach. Sometimes it's about a, a new approach or a different approach. So uh, are they using any, using any image-assisted app such as Snapchat or... Uh, this other one called Meal Logger, which is more of a closed environment, allows the athletes to just quickly take a photo mm -hmm. of, of what they consumed, um, and it, you know, it takes them a second, uh, and then the dietitian or nutritionist can review it and just give a thumbs up or a comment or a like, or if it's poor, they yep. can re respond back. And so it's way, really quick and easy to really give the feedback. It's really quick and easy, super, super quick for the athlete, and then essentially there's no uh, reason why the athlete shouldn't, unless they forget, record what their diet is, because it literally takes a second. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's a good meal or a bad meal, they've recorded it, and then it's, essentially it's monitoring, right? Because we don't need to know, once we've set up the dietary plan, and we've set up goals, we don't need to know exactly what the calories are every day. Mm -hmm. We just want to make sure that they're on, on doing the intervention that we, we ask them to do. You know, they're, they're adhering to the dietary plan. Yeah. So if they're taking photos of the wrong types of foods, you provide comments of that. Yeah. Um, so so this get on my breakfast level is some <laughs> cool guy's response to his uh, big breakfast thing. There. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, we've got here um, a trial of this sort yeah, of approach, so haven't we? That, uh, yeah. We've got the University of Auckland badge there. Some yeah, of our so after research. feedback from one of the uh, dietitians, we conducted a study in New Zealand looking at meal logger. So this would be a t typical case study for a lot of um, sports teams in New Zealand. So this is New Zealand under 21 hockey squad. Right, This hockey squad, they live in different sites in New Zealand. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's no way the dietitian can visit, you know, can't go from, from town to town to town. No. There's not enough money or resources for that. They normally or traditionally would see them at a training camp maybe a couple of times a year and maybe they'll just get, get emailed in some information mm -hmm. and, and it's quite, I guess, passive the interaction or the advice that they can give. One way. Yeah, yeah. one way and, and just it's not very periodic. Um, so what we uh, looked at doing was leading up to the national tournament because that would be selection for the under-21 squad. So they're mm -hmm. already in the squad, but you know they want to make the squad for the next year, obviously. Um, we ran a six-week study where they needed to monitor their diet. We only did three days per week because we, you know, we, they weren't, um, they weren't, I guess, part of our team. They were part of different teams at the time. Yep. But, but what we did is we asked them to monitor their diet three days a week, mm -hmm. and we provided some nutrition knowledge through the app as well. So we posted some, some videos and information and what we saw is we saw really high compliance. Um, sort of, you know, it started off at 86 and waned a little bit at week, week, week six. Right. Um, but what we also saw was really good. 86 is pretty good though. Yeah, 86. <laughs> because we, at this, it doesn't matter if they miss one meal because no. as long as they get the next few meals, that's okay. Yeah, right? yeah. We're monitoring their, their, their habit. We're not monitoring every single meal. So no. it's okay if they miss a couple. So that's a good, good compliance. But what we saw is we, we did a you know a pre and post questionnaire and we saw improved dietary behaviours. Mm -hmm. We saw improved nutrition knowledge as well because mm -hmm. you know a lot of these athletes don't have. Yeah, much you forget about knowledge. the educational benefit. Yeah, of doing yeah. This so of it's a way of doing some mass education from the nutritionist to a whole squad, mm. quite simply through an app and through a closed environment. And what we also saw was the the average response time thirty nine minutes it was actually a lot lower than that. So if you know you posted an image of your meal. If it was at breakfast, the, the response time was really quick, right? Um, your response time, you mean how quickly the dietitian Yeah, how, how quickly I, I get a notification when you post. It says, yeah. you know, is it quick enough to stop them eating it? <laughs> <laughs> Almost, because it's, it's instant. But the reason it was 39 minutes is because sometimes someone might eat something at 10 p.m. at night. The dietitian's gone to bed. Right, so yeah. the average, oh, okay, so that average includes average, overnight. So, yeah, okay. so with the minimum... Oh, that is really quick then. Yeah, yeah, so um, the minimum response time was, you know... Is, uh, I wish we would have a look, but it was just a couple of few minutes, you know, because... Yeah. Um, You're setting up dietitians, though, to be on a 24-hour shift here, aren't you? Well, <laughs> or it's, it's a different model where you've got a different... Uh, yeah, where it's not just one diet. You might have a couple who work quite different. Oh, great. oh yeah, so so for example, you could... Um, your nighttime snacks could be going to the side of the world yeah, to or, a, a, some, a dietitian that's exactly, awake. Exactly, or you're, you're a, if you want to set up your own company as a nutritionist, mm. right, then you may have a, an intern or someone else working for you, but you might do the nutrition cons consultations and, and give the dietary advice and plan yeah. and you may have someone that's working for you part time that maybe monitors the app when, you not, when you're not working and they're, get, yeah. they're getting money you know, maybe they work between 6pm and 10pm and they're monitoring that and they've got nutrition knowledge background and they can provide the right advice and then, yeah. um, so it's just it's looking at doing nutrition in a different way knowing all these limitations we've talked about of the other techniques oh that's great Luke and you've got a little picture here of um, yeah. just a real quick photo of a yeah. meal so this is a, um, this was an athlete's meal pre not much effort's gone in there on the composition or anything no. it's fairly no, rough and ready this is a rough and ready meal they've just taken a photo 
And I don't mean on the composition of the meat, I mean yeah, on the yeah, framing of the yeah, photo. Yeah, they're just, <laughs> they're, they're, that's what you get, you know, some of them are blurry, but it doesn't really matter so much. And so what we've gotten is an example of the feedback. And that's the red text there. Yeah, so awesome bricky, you know, a full fibre, complex carbs give you slow burning energy across the day. So a bit of motivation to the mm. athlete that they're doing well. Um, also nice to see you having a good protein source, so almost giving the athlete a little bit of uh, nutrition education yeah. if they didn't know. Um, uh, and also, yeah, eggs. It's egg. friendly chat. Yeah, it's friendly it's chat. Quite potent, um, yeah. You know, great pre-game meal choice as well. Um, and what what I we haven't talked about with this app it was a closed team environment. So there's a squad of say 20, 20 athletes, mm-hmm. but they could all see each other's meals. So they could um, comment on each other or like each other's oh, meals. Oh, a bit so, of peer pressure. A bit of peer pressure oh. that they're eating well. So you can't be posting crap food because yeah. You know, if, and and we we also looked at does this improve? Oh no, I, that's good. That would get to the stage though where you are actually not posting your own food to, <laughs> to make sure you're you're, yeah, you're not. So obviously guiding. you can turn that off. It's up to okay. how you'd like to do it. But no, that'd be great. We, 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 we if, were interested though if because he's uh, I guess this is going away from dietary assessment. But if these athletes are living in Wellington, Auckland, and Christchurch. Yeah, so they're cities at both ends of our uh, North Island and on on the South Island. And we want them to be a team and come together and perform when they're playing for New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Right, so if they're having more communication as a team when they're in remote areas through something like this, Mm -hmm. you know, there's more. And when someone posted something bad or good, you know, you know what players are like, they'd get on there and they'd give each other a bit of a ribbing for something. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's good. So it it depends what you're using it for. I guess it's just... Yeah. We were interested in that. Yeah, as course. long as the levels of banter don't get <laughs> yeah, take course. it too far, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you, someone's monitoring it. Yeah, that, so that, you that could keep like them separate, or you could group them. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, I know that with Mealogger and one of the um, rugby teams, what they did is they created two separate groups where you had okay. weight losers and weight gainers. Ah, right. great. So, so everyone's every, trying everyone who's yeah, posting okay. the meals pre pre season, we're posting weight losing, you know, meals, yeah. and then so it's encouragement, and you're all trying to do the same thing. So you know, there's you can break people up into different groups. Yeah, oh, that's way. that's brilliant. You could easily, you could even you're probably already doing this. People into groups with different allergies, food preferences, abstinence-based practices, and all kinds yeah, of things. You can, couldn't you? Yeah. 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 Well, that that's definitely the future then. Um, right. Let's move on then and have a look at talking about um, assessing from uh, individual assessment from this nutrition or dietetics perspective. Then what well, you got the first thing we need to do here. <laughs> yeah, so essentially, I guess before we assess the diet, is you know what is the purpose of well, what's the dietary goal? What are we trying to achieve? Mm. Are we trying to achieve some weight loss, some weight gain? Is there a performance goal or some sort yep. of competition goal at the end? Is it um, you know is it planning for competition? Uh, do we have some sort of travel coming up and we're trying to work around that? So it's understanding what what the dietary goal is first, and then you know I guess that informs our assessment and and, and our um, and dietary plan going forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we've got um, yeah. So this is the, the, the points that go yeah, into the assessment. Yeah. So I mean, it's part of assessing someone's diet. If you're going to be providing some nutrition advice, you can't just assess their diet because you need to know their social history. Mm-hmm. So are they flatting? Are they still living with their parents, or are they living? Are they married? You know, they have family. Flatting is key flatting, for yeah, living yeah. with mates in an apartment yeah. or a, or yeah. a dive. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Um, because that will impact greatly of what sort of meals that they can have, mm-hmm. if they can modify their meals, or if someone else prepares their meals. Because we can't give good dietary advice unless we know all that social information. Yeah. So that's actually really important to go with the diet history. It's probably the most important aspect. Yeah. Uh, and then we're covering these the items we kind of just talked about before is understanding, well then, okay, what is their training load? What is their training intensity? Yeah. This will inform, obviously, what their requirements will be in yeah. terms of energy, macronutrients, and we, we tend to call that the new trendy term periodized nutrition. So periodizing the nutrition to where they are in the phases of their training, travel, and competition. Yeah. I think you've put travel schedule yeah. next on there. Yeah, uh, we have. Uh, and then there's other aspects. Obviously, biochemistry is important. Yeah, Some, what do you mean by biochemistry? Well, well, things like your, your blood tests, right? So things like iron, right? Yeah. So obviously, if someone had a low iron status, it's going to impact their performance if yeah. they're an endurance athlete. Or they're in a potentially marginal group for yeah. iron status. Yeah, so if they're in a potentially marginal group, then we can make some adjustments to their diet to make sure that we're not in there. So it's part of the dietary assessment, and that's not, you might see that with your diet history that they're not consuming much, you know, good sources of heme iron, which is, you know, um, animal-based... Um, generally, Generally yeah. animal-based uh, iron sources, um, you know, but then they might not be consuming very good um, plant-based sources of iron. Mm. Um, so you might see that, but the biochemistry gives you a, a, a accurate marker of yeah, where they actually... Yeah, you're not anemic based on your diet. You have no, to be functionally anemic, anemic based yeah. on So you can't uh, make that call without the biochemistry. Yeah, yeah. You can't just look yeah. at the diet and say... No, no, you, you, you can't adjust the, the diet, diet when there's actually no problem yeah, physiologically. Yeah, so you need those. Yeah. You need those biochemistry. And then, you, then you've got the physical characteristics there. 
Yeah, so obviously we need to, as part of our assessment of the requirements, we need to obviously accurately measure their body weight and if they're interested in, you know, the skin folds to talk mm. about, you know, percent body, body fat and um, anything else you're interested in. Yeah. Um, and then the, from that information, then we're assist, estimating those requirements yeah. for our goals. Yeah. Um, and once uh, and that's, we've been talking about that part of the process mostly the today. Before, yeah, sure. um, and you've mentioned the follow-up. Yes. Before as well. Yeah, I have mentioned the follow-up. So essentially, you know, once we've got that dietary plan, we then follow-up assessments where we, you know, measure the adherence to that plan and how's it going, basically. Well, look, that's a really good overview of all of the issues where um, the technology is taking us to improve them and uh, how to how to work with this specific population. So I've got some summary points here for the kind of things that I hope people watching the video will take away and they can read those. Yep. But thanks a lot for coming uh, or wherever Sydney to talk to me. Yep. And we're going to uh, really Cheers. excited about all of the collaborations and uh, new technologies that you're uh, developing. And that's the end of this video. But um, all of the uh, research articles we've cited are open access. You can find those on the internet using the um, links below. And we'll have a few other links and things on there that you've seen um, uh, as we went through uh, the slides we've, we've shown here. Um, that's the end of the video. Oh, thank you.